start with our first one. This was actually not a J.D. Edwards um, client. This was just a small construction company. But I wanted to bring it into focus because of um, one thing that I'll explain towards the end. And so, But I'll, I'll get into the reason why I've included it at the end. They weren't running much. Uh, very small um, company. They they had basically Exchange Server, QuickBooks, and Microsoft Office. Now, interestingly enough, they did have two support companies, one that was handling the firewall and one that was handling the internal architecture and backups and all that. Now, they did have monitoring in place, and they had some pretty good um, monitoring in place, but the internal place did not exactly, under, um, since they weren't responsible for the the firewall, um, the firewall monitoring company did not have outbound um, traffic monitoring in place. They did have endpoint protections, a couple servers, a few workstations. And interestingly enough, they did have air gapped backups in place. So sounds good, right? Sounds really good. Like they should not have ever gotten hit. Well, they did. The dark side ransomware hack group um, got into this into this system. Now, interestingly enough, there are two faults here that caused or that allowed this to happen. The first fault was that there was an exchange server patch that um, failed. It looked like it had applied. Everything looked like it, it did, but digging in deeper, the patch did not um, did not apply to, to their exchange server properly. So the hacking group got in through there and they installed, managed to install their software. The problem is, um, is, is that it really couldn't talk back to the home because the um, firewall rules did not allow um, for that kind of traffic. And it was actually on port 3389, an SMB port. So six months later, they were in the system continually trying to ping their home base um, and failing. But then the second software group um, took a, um, an update to the firewall and they failed to put back in the rules that they had in place before that. 3389 happened to be a hole that was opened up. So now the um, software that was installed that, that had been waiting for six months had a way to get through the firewall, report it back to home, and, and then the dark side group did their thing, spent some time looking in the system. Um, and they also, um, they encrypted the data, but there was no useful data exfiltration to have much to work with, you know, their own personal um, bookkeeping software wasn't of, of much interest to them. So let's talk a little bit about um, the resolution. So in this case, no ransomware was paid. They did have um, offsite backups, um, and they had to restore from the offsite backups. I told you that they had an air gapped um, data um, backups, but here's what happened. Um, when they tr um, the, the resolution team tried to bring the backups um, back online, they had not completely eradicated the um, the attack. And as soon as they established contact with the um, air gap database, it started getting encrypted. So you had air gapping, but what was wrong about it is it wasn't locked air gap. Um, locked meaning you can't touch it afterwards, you know, read only. It was once it was put online, uh, it too was was hacked. So they lost a few days of QuickBooks data. Um, some mailboxes had to be restored from PST files. They did um, they did use that and it took about a week um, um, to become 100% functional. Now, interestingly enough, the resolution team got a face-to-face -face visit with the FBI on this one. And it's not that this um, small construction company was of any interest to the FBI per se, they, they were, but where they were more interested is that the ransomware group was really using this as a jump point. They were using this company to get in from out of the country to attack um, other companies in the United States and look and appear to get around the fact that they weren't located here. Um, so the they weren't really interested in this company and they did not exfiltrate data. They did 
start um, wiping out data to cover their tracks. Um, but but that was about it. So uh, very, very interesting. Um, some lessons learned. The air gap backups were not locked. They waited for all the file systems to be mounted to get um, encrypted, um, to encrypt the backups. Um, you got to lock your um, backups, even even an admin, you know, if you can hack the admin's account, um, that that can that can be a problem. Um, patches need to be double checked. Um, even patches that show is applied. In this case, they, they weren't um, applied, even though the patch said successful. So it was notification of success and it really wasn't. Um, they also um, had did not have a procedure for validating firewalls um, during that upgrade. And of course, there could have been better communication um, between um, the two vendors, um, one really not paying as much attention to the other as they both should have. Um, and they also did not have an incident response plan. And you really should have that even if you're a small company, have some sort of plan in place, you know, like setting up you know getting um, and i'll talk about this later if we have time getting uh, um, a bitcoin wallet set up ahead of time getting the tor browser downloaded just a few things because the last thing you want to do when you're being if you're being attacked if you're thinking to pay um, the last thing you want to do is take a day or more to get your um, bitcoin wallet set up because it will take some time you really have to prove who are who you are and it, it is not something that happens in 15 minutes so in planning ahead, getting your incident response plan, double checking your backups to make sure the backups are valid, that you have an offline backup. In this case, they did have an offline backup and that helped save them. So some things that they could have used, they did not really have any guidance. Um, VSISO offerings, you can get a very small contract that even a, even a company of this size could afford to pay um pay for visa so virtual CISO that which is a shared resource um if they'd have had a tool like threat locker for allow list listing and ring fencing um that might have helped um prevent things like their quickbooks from getting um taken down and encrypted and and maybe also um their exchange server um, a SIM uh, might not be affordable for um, a small company, but at the very least, you need to be looking at your outbound firewall logs. SIMs make that a little bit easier. So at the very least, you need to be looking at those logs. And of course, I'm always a big fan of DNS protection, um, like DNS filter or um, OpenDNS slash Cisco umbrella. Um, that captures um, roughly 80% of um, GSI's malware and um, smaller at attempts through phishing. It just it just catches so much. It's not perfect, but it is a frontline tool that makes life a lot easier.